Hi, this is Roger. Thanks for dropping by. My Sunday morning chat is going to be based around the idea of learning and how knowledge grows. Around the theme that if I knew then what I knew now, how much difference would it have made? And this might shock you. <laughs> Let's have a think about back at my other house. So that's before I moved down here. I had some Phalaenopsis and a Sherry baby. Um, and in those days when you bought uh, Phalaenopsis, virtually across the board, they were potted in bark. I don't know what sort of bark. I don't know how good or bad it was. And I don't believe I ever repotted an orchid at that house. So they lived in their bark. And I think in the main they were in clear pots for as long as I had them which was quite a long time in some cases. I did have a couple die, I seem to remember, and I got some new ones in, and, and life went on. Now, I lived in Wiltshire at that time, which is where my daughter lives. The TDS reading on her tap water is over 400 parts per million. Yeah, and the pH is up near 8, about 7.8, something like that. So that's what I used. I just poured tap water on my orchids and it all flooded out the bottom and, and I didn't know that's whether that was the right way to water them or not. That's just what I did. And every now and again when I thought about it, they got some baby bio houseplant food and it was like one drip per pint or something, I think the measurements were. And it was, I don't believe that was strong stuff anyway. So they did get a little bit of food now and again. But let's think about what was going on in the pot. Obviously, as the bark aged, it would start to break down. And when bark breaks down, when any organic media breaks down, it becomes more acidic than sometimes we would like. And then what happens when I poured the water on it? With a pH of 7.8. Think it through. So was my media really acidic? Probably not. Now, I didn't know all this. This is like what I know now, working backwards, yeah? Worth thinking about. Um, anyway, stuff got tap water. And then I moved down here, and some, some of my orchids came with me, and I started getting a few more and cluttering up my windowsills. Um, and so life went on, and I can remember getting some cattleyas. And um, they, were, they were potted in bark. And I, I didn't even query how long they'd been in their pots. But I was a bit wary of repotting, certainly the cattleyas, because I hadn't done it before. So you get this sort of inbuilt fear. You're, you're sort of frightened of killing the plant and destroying the root system and daft things like that. Um, I got braver as time went on. Um, <clears throat> so again, I was using tap water. I didn't have the information. I hadn't bothered checking the information. So yet again, my tap water down here has a TDS of about 240. Yeah, 240 parts per million. And again, it has a pH heading up towards the 8 mark. So if my bark in my cattleyas was starting to break down and getting a bit acidic, what happened when I watered them? I would have washed a lot of that acidity, acidity out and replaced it with quite a high pH. And the bark would have been wet. And it would have stayed like that until such time as the acidity in the bark started to take over again. And then they'd have got watered again and reversed the process. Yeah. Now that process can't happen anymore because I'm using RO water, because I know about these things now and the purest water you can get is obviously good for your orchids. But it can make work. Let's think about what's happening now with bark that's starting to break down, or worse still, bark of a small grade mixed with moss, which will break down faster. My logic for using that type of mix will be it's for an orchid that needs to stay moist and shouldn't dry out quickly. No wet dry cycle, things like Oncidiums, certainly my um, Miltoniopsis, Restrepias, Masdevallias, Draculas, not supposed to dry out at all. So they would get heavy on the moss and a small bark mix so that it stays moist in a long time. 
and it's going to break down quicker. And when it starts to break down, it will start turning acidic. <clears throat> and then I pour water on that's nowadays carefully controlled. And let's say I've got a nice weak feed in my RO water and I've adjusted my pH down from where it started to a suitable level for the plants. Now pour that on a mix that's starting to break down. And its effect is negligible. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, so sometimes knowledge can add in work. Um, I mean, I'm not afraid to repot plants now. I still say the best time to repot any orchid is when you see new roots growing. That doesn't change and that's virtually across the board. But then I've got some orchids that put out roots continuously. So there isn't a, a precise point when you can say, right, I've got a shed load of new roots, now's the time to repot. They just pop out a root now and again, things like the um, Paphiopedalums. You know, they tend to put on a few new roots with a new growth. Um, but they might still push out some roots from one of the older growths. They just pop out a root now and again. <laughs> and certainly not that frequently compared with some anyway. You know, so, um, you know, I now know a point at which repotting makes more sense than not. And as such is going to stress the plant less than it would do at other times. So, you know, that's, that's knowledge well gathered, well learnt and learnt by experience. Um, you know, I've lost a set of Cattleya roots by repotting at the wrong time and you've then got a plant with virtually no root system. Now it will put out some new roots eventually, but in the meantime it's going to go downhill for a bit. You know, the, the pseudobulbs are going to start to desiccate a bit because they're not getting hydrated properly. So it is worth noting that sort of thing. Um, Something I've never done is get my plants wet. It's a very rare occurrence for my plants to get wet. They may get wet if I'm spraying an insecticide or a fungicide, but then I'd only do that relatively early in the day that I know the temperature is going to get up and the fans are going to be on and it's going to dry the plants off quickly. So I've never really made my plants wet. So I've never had to worry about things like um, getting water trapped in the crowns of Phalaenopsis because I don't get them wet so it doesn't happen you know um, and quite honestly with really good circulation and reasonable temperatures that water is going to evaporate off pretty quickly it's when water hangs around it can cause problems you know pathogens bacteria can start breeding in small pockets of water and then they can get at your plant so uh, you know <clears throat> that is worth bearing in mind, certainly. Um, other things, uh, let me think. Um, repotting really is the big one. Um, it is a stressful time, you know. I mean, if, if you grow in things like Lekka or possibly the large Ceramis or River Rock, anything that doesn't really hold water, in theory, the root disturbance is very, very light, you know, and if a bit of lecker is stuck to your roots and you've decided to repot it, it doesn't matter because it's inert. It's not organic. It doesn't matter, you know, unless you've got some sort of infection in the pot, in which case it all needs to come off and get sterilised or just put new in. Um, so there's that sort of thing to think about. Um, but really, it's... <laughs> The knowledge builds up dramatically at first, you know, you start off knowing nothing and after a relatively short period of time you'd be surprised how much you've picked up. But then it tails off and the learning curve heads towards being flat. It's never dead flat, there's always something new to learn, especially if you start venturing into different types of orchids that you haven't had before. So the learning curve goes back up for a bit. But it never stops. There's always some little tip to pick up from another grower or something like that. Um, the art with the knowledge really is remembering what's relevant to you and not get our little brains cluttered up with stuff you don't need to know. Muddling up the good stuff. You know, there are some few basic 
principles for growing orchids, depending on the type, yes, and it does vary a bit, but you know, um, a lot of the orchids I've got need a wet dry cycle. Well, that, that's once you know that, you don't need to know it again. <laughs> if you see what, well, you don't need to relearn it. You just need to know that this type of orchid, when it's watered, needs a good soak and it needs to be dry. And if it needs to do it quickly, it needs to go in the sort of media or pot and or pot to make that happen or amount where it can happen, sometimes too quickly. But you've got that and, and plants that shouldn't dry out, you know, they, they, they need a mix to suit them. Um, so, you know, they're, they're sort of choosing your media for the type of orchid and the way it grows. That's knowledge you need to have, really. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I've seen people growing cattleyas in water culture. Now, there, there must be a period of adaptation for those roots because they're not going to like it at first. You know, it's the equivalent of a soggy mix. But um, a sort of semi-hydro process where you, you know, your, your, your plants are bare rooted basically in some sort of container, glass basal vase, um, jam jar, glass, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter really what it's in. It's your own aesthetics because most people who grow that way grow in the home and it needs to look nice. And it's nice to see the roots. But, you know, f filling up to the base of the plant, allowing it to soak for a while, whether it's a day or whatever you do, you'll have your own ways of doing it, and then pouring the water out and letting those roots dry off again. That's not much different to being in large bark or on a mount. Really, it might look different. And you'll get some old school orchid growers say, well, oh, you can't grow plants in water. Orchids don't grow like that. They're not bog plants. Well. Go away. <laughs> Just have a look at what people are doing. They can be very successful, you know, if that's the way you... Quite honestly, if I was growing indoors, I'd be thinking along those lines for some orchids, because it, it can work well. Um, I don't particularly like lecker. Um, it doesn't suit me. I just, somehow I just don't like it. But I'd be quite happy to give lava rock a go, or pebbles you know, small pea, pea gravel or something like that, which is totally inert. You know, the water goes in and comes out the bottom, basically, and your roots get hydrated and then they dry off. That can suit a lot of orchids. But um, never believe that you know it all, because <laughs> you won't. There'll always be something you've missed or forgotten. You know, we take a lot in. Can you retain it all? <laughs> it all goes in there. But the problem sometimes is getting it back out again. You know, the retrieval mechanism can let us down sometimes. I'm sure somebody told me that once. Oh, I'm blowed if I can remember what they said. You know, it, it happens. But, you know, you'll have a set of general rules. You'll have your way of feeding and watering, um, your way and timing with repotting, the medias you choose, the pots you choose. And quite honestly, the best thing to do is just ask yourself, is this working okay? And if it is, then you're probably doing most things right. And then we go back to what I said before, watering with lousy water, hardly ever feeding, leaving plants in pots for donkey's years and letting the bark break down, but they still sort of did okay. Now I know now that if I had applied things differently in those times, they may have grown better. And that's where the knowledge comes in. It's not really, are my plants still alive? It's how well are they doing? <clears throat> are those new growths pushing up at least the size of the previous ones, preferably a bit bigger or a bit thicker or a bit stronger? Is the latest root set of roots better than the previous set? These are signs of improvement, which is signs of good culture, yeah? And therein lies the signs of perhaps not such good culture. You know, are my latest two cattleya growths on my nice specimen-sized cattleya a bit undersized? Well, they could have been winter growths and didn't get enough light. You have to kick that little bit in, <laughs> add that little bit of knowledge in. You know, stuff that grows from spring into the growing season is probably going to do better than stuff that grows from the autumn into winter, you know. 
And all these things you pick up on the way. Um, they might not be obvious, but, you know, o over a period of time, they become obvious. And, and that's learning by looking. And quite honestly, that's a pretty good way of doing it. But, um, I mean, I got heavily into feeding and nutrients and the way that plants absorb nutrients and how they're used and what they're for. I didn't actually need any of that. It's useful to know and I enjoyed learning about it. I didn't really need to know. I've got a perfectly good fertilizer and I'm using it at a level that has been advised by many people, including the manufacturer. <laughs> um, you know, so I'd have been okay without that knowledge. But I enjoy that sort of learning. So for me, it was useful. It's also useful to know that um, <clears throat> pH does has an, have an effect on the way some of the nutrients are absorbed, if at all. You know, I mean, you, you keep your pH high, you're going to have trouble getting things like iron in there, because that needs a low pH. But then there's chelated iron, which gets in better at a much wider range of pH. Now, I didn't know that. I do now. And I still swing my pH. I still change it. You know, same level of feed, but go in at a higher end pH, 6.4, 6.5, and next time go down to the 5.8, 5.9. I don't go any lower than that. I just don't trust it. You know, the way the pH scale works, it's a logarithm logarithmic log it goes up by a factor of 10 <laughs> so you know the difference between a pH of 7 and 6 is like 10 times more acidic so between 6 and 5 it's 10 times more acidic between 7 and 5 it's 100 times now that sounds a bit dramatic to me so the lowest I ever go is 5.8 and I'm happy that at that pH the nutrients that need the lower pH to work reasonably well are getting in there yeah and then at the higher h the others get in some of them get in almost whatever you do you know and as i said before i quite happily chuck tap water on my plants for for a long long time but i now i didn't know why that was okay then but now i do and that's knowing things learnt recently working them back to what was really going on, yeah? So breaking down media was almost getting compensated by the type of water I was using. That's not the best of ideas, but it sort of worked, you know. <laughs> and I bet you wouldn't find an orchid grower that recommends that, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Anyway, the learning never stops. Never underestimate what you know, and even somebody who's only been growing orchids for six months that's watching YouTube videos, you know, doing a bit of a Google search now and again, get a new plant in, you know, especially if it's a species, get on Google, put the plant name in, you'll get some stuff comes up, it'll help you. Um, I mean, or orchid, I think it's orchidspecies.com will, will come up on the list. If you put a species plant name in, you know, Dendrobium anosmum, one of the items on that list will be orchidspecies.com and it will give you a clue where it comes from, the elevation it grows in, whether it needs a drier winter, whether it's a high light thing. You should get a reasonable bit of information and then other sites will come up, some of which will totally contradict that. That's the fun bit. <laughs> <laughs> and I still say, if you find five sites that say one thing and one site that says something quite different, don't underestimate that odd one. They could be right. That could be new information. And the other five sites have just copied each other and brought forward old information instead of doing new research and, you know, new expeditions out into the unexplored territories and finding plants growing in their natural environment, at which point you know how it grows in the wild. You've been there, seen it, and got the t-shirt. That's the real stuff, yeah? It's the same with this winter rest thing. It's quite a lot of my dendrobiums come from parts of the world that I've never been to and will probably never go to. There's some parts of the world they come from where you might never be seen again if you go looking for them. But you can chat to people who live there. 
people who will tell you, well, it's all very well, just because the monsoon rains have stopped, it doesn't mean everything's dry the next day. Everything stays soaking wet for months. It doesn't really dry out till Christmas. Now, this is from people who live there. It's first-hand information. That's good stuff. I'll listen to that every single time. Yeah? And again, you can find pictures of plants in situ. Well, that, that'll give you a clue whether the plant grows mainly on bare bark or whether it's buried in amongst loads of other plants. That'll give you a clue as to what you ought to pot it in or how you might want to grow it. That information's out there. You know, and a picture can tell uh, tells a story of a... Th well, I don't know what the expression is, but you know what I mean. Pictures and videos show the real thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, the information's out there if you want to bother. And if you don't want to bother, all your plants aren't going to die. You only need some basic information to keep them going. To grow them well, get them into shows, get that perfection, specimen-sized plants, You'll need a bit of extra work and a bit of extra care. But that doesn't mean to say all your plants are going to die because you're a beginner or whatever. Or because you're growing in the home and you haven't got a greenhouse. It's, it's, it's you know, plants, are, plants will adapt. They'll become accustomed to where you're growing them as long as it's not too far off the mark. You know, I mean, growing a Mazda Valia above a radiator on a windowsill in full sun it ain't gonna work. <laughs> it might last a week or two, but long term, it's not gonna make it. You know, that dry heat off your radiator and the sun beating down on it, that's not what it wants. But some other orchids might survive that. You never know. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna leave it at that because I have got some work to do today. I've still got, <clears throat> I still keep looking at where I've put the plants and thinking, well, it wasn't a bad effort for a first attempt, but I, I need to move stuff. And all the mounts are coming down to be watered now. So I'm going to try and get as many down as possible and then rethink where I put them before I put them back up again. Um, but there's some of the larger plants are actually casting shadows from some of the smaller plants. Now, they need to get farther back. And I'm thinking about where the racks are, especially this one over here. If you have a look at that now, all those plants on that rack are in the shadows. You can see what's happening on the other side of that rack. It's getting all the light from the bright day we've currently got. So some of my plants that did okay hanging in the glass, and you can see my Jenkins eyes up there, yeah, well that could live on the back of that rack. That did fine without any extra lights, yeah? But there are some that, because of where they hung through previous winters, wouldn't have got enough light, because they weren't up this end. This is the end where the brightest light is, certainly in the winter when it's not there for long. And then only when we get a bright to sunny day. On a dull day, the light level's the same everywhere in here, and it's not good enough, <laughs> hence the lights. So I have got some repositioning to do. Big things like this are in the way. Um, now this one hasn't spent a winter with me yet. This, this was actually purchased early last spring. Um, now this eventually gets, uh, this is Dendrobium bolenium, I think it is. This eventually becomes deciduous, but I got it with four strapping relatively new growths on it, which are still growing. Yeah, they're still producing new leaves. But up in the silhouette there, you can also see there's one, two, three, four, there's five new growths up there coming on. So that's going to be grown on through the winter. Yeah. So that doesn't need to go anywhere where it needs the highlight coming in through the glass. It's not going to be that type of orchid or certainly not this winter. My nobilies and things, they can just stay up the back of that shelf. That's where they lived last year and the year before and the year before that. They can just stay up there. Don't need to even think about those. But what I would like to do is reposition some of the oncidiums that I'd like to keep growing this year as I have the opportunity to do that. So a uh, bit of shuffling around <clears throat> and don't don't get bogged down with the thought that you're a beginner and you know nothing. I'll bet you know more than you think you do. 
And as I said, there's 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 some good orchid channels around, putting up some good videos with some useful information. Um, it's just a matter of finding some videos, perhaps about this new type of orchid you've got. Um, you know, and, and have a look and see what somebody else does and see if it works. Try and make sure you find out where they live, because what they do where they live might not be the same as what you need to do. You know, looking at somebody growing all their orchids hanging off of trees in Florida might not be ideal if you live in the UK or Scandinavia or the top end of Canada or something. It ain't going to work. <laughs> so you need to uh, just think about where somebody is. I mean, even Danny's growing methods can't be compared with mine because she's going to get longer days and far, far more brighter days than I can get and many more of them. So her growing conditions are different to mine. Yeah? And her grow room's different to mine simply because it hasn't got a clear roof, which can do wonders for some plants. That all-round light instead of it coming in through the sides. <clears throat> so have a think about where somebody's growing and does that compare? And if it doesn't, their information might not be quite as useful as somebody grows that grows in a similar set of conditions to you do. So you need to be selective. But, uh, I'll leave it at that. I've got no new blooms to look at. Nothing's opened over the last uh, short period since I last did a video. And um, uh, I've got other things to do during the week. Um, I need to get back onto the um, sort of dendrobium series heading in towards winter and the resting period. And I still haven't selected the ones that are on the fence. Am I going to rest this one or not? So I need to go over my decision making process for those orchids. I've just done one of them. Yeah, This orchid would naturally be drier in winter, but not in the sort of conditions where it would get a harsh winter with very low temperatures and virtually no rain. It doesn't come from that sort of place. So I can quite happily not rest that one, just reduce down the watering a bit, but I don't want to stop feeding it. It's got five new growths. You know, I'll stall them. That doesn't get any food. So, you know, I've got to be selective. <clears throat> so I'll go over the ones, the, the actual decision. Right, are you going to be rested, yes or no? And then we'll come up with a list of those that are going to be rested, and then we can keep our eye on those as we progress towards winter. Um, I mean, this is a mess up here at the moment. Is it? I got fed up with putting plants back, so I just dumped them where I found a space. My Herco Glossum doesn't get rested. I do reduce the feed down, but I don't stop it, and I do reduce the watering because of the shorter days. Now there's a decision. What shorter days? Think it through. If I'm going to use these lights to extend my day lengths, how much this winter should I be reducing my feed and watering on those that continue to grow? My only problem will be temperatures, which are going to go down. Therefore, things will slow up. They might not slow up as much as perhaps they have done in the past, simply because they're going to get that extra light for that extra length of time. So, like I said, it's a bit of a new era for me. This is the first time I've ever had supplemental lights. God, my mouth won't work. More coffee. <laughs> um, extra lights. <laughs> if you can't say a word, think of another one. <laughs> uh, and I'll see you next time. But as I said, we'll get, we'll get back to the winter resting dendrobiums during the uh, coming week and um, finalise where plants are going to be. Um, I want to get my paphiopedalums out. Yeah? I mean, they're up against the glass, but in, in an area that gets the least of the sun. And in the winter, the sun's so low in the sky, they never see any, which is why the shade netting can come off. The sun never hits that bit because it goes down below low enough that you see that shadow there. I get a shadow like that in the winter from the fence where the sun's so low in the sky. So these ones down here just don't get that direct sun in through the glass like some of the others do. So, uh, yeah, we'll be repositioning plants. By the time I've finished, it'll be spring, I expect. <laughs> and then we'll have to change positions again. It's all good fun, isn't it? <laughs>
keeps you on your toes, yeah? Is my plant in the best possible place I can put it for its growth, you know, its style, everything else? And I bet when you make that decision, you then look at another plant and think, actually, that one needs to go where that one is. And I haven't got room for two. So you'll have to make allowances. <laughs> you know, they can't all go up against the glass unless you've got a windowsill 30 foot long. <laughs> anyway, see you next time. Thanks for dropping by.